like I interview kids all the time and they tell me constantly, like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to do this job, mostly in sales. And I said, what it takes is it takes hours in the seat. Your ass needs to be in the seat. If you're not in the seat, you're not going to succeed. And when I leave here, I leave here, when I come to the office, I don't come every day. But when I leave, I usually leave between six and seven. I mean, it's, the place is a ghost town. Like literally the lights in our office are set to shut off at seven o'clock because nobody's here. Like that's not ass in the seat. You can call people until nine o'clock at night. And every now and again, I see somebody bleary eyed walking out of here at seven o'clock. As a 20 year old, you've got to put those hours in. You got to kind of understand, you got to push through it. Cause if you, it just requires time in a lot of instances. So you have to kind of put that on, on the shelf before you come into the, some of the strategies with when long, letting long hours dictate bad habits. It's funny how the definition of whatever it takes has changed over time. When you, For when, sure. you and I, when you and I would say whatever it takes, it meant 100 hours if that was necessary in a week to get something done. It's a little different today. Whatever it takes means whatever it takes between 8.30 and 5 o'clock. That's whatever. You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a uh, hot mic, Sam. It's 30 minutes away. I'll be there in 10. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Ian, you son of a bitch. Frankie, we are um, back from our long-awaited return uh, after nine months and we are on episode three and you and I are already talking about burnout is, is, that, is that a problem are we already burned out again after three episodes on podcasting that we're I doing can, this episode? Well, what I think is I can tell you with great certainty is this we figured out how to fill the time <laughs> get together to do this I do love talking to you but get together to do this is hard well, it was either that or talk about Palestine and Israel, and uh, we're not exactly qualified being a couple of boys from Michigan and Florida. So this is what you're getting, folks. So I apologize. But so there's talk about sports coaches quitting. So one of the things I'm interested in talking about with this is I actually think we might disagree on this one. I didn't want to tell you it prior. So I'm, I'm it, I think let's kick it off, and I'll tell you where I think my head's a little different. So this episode is burn out the new normal. Uh, Based on a based on two stats that I've seen over the past week that just came through some regular feed that I've been looking at, but one of them was a study that CBS did um, in late 2023 where uh, they found that 38 percent of Division One head coaches in basketball and football are experiencing burnout, um, and their the take they had on that is that is up from around like 10 percent if you'd have looked at it 15 years ago. And uh, in addition, the number is pretty similar. Forty uh, percent of Gen Z workers believe that burnout is now an inevitable part of success. That if you want to have success, at some point, you're going to reach burnout of some kind. And it, it reminds me of in 1998. Uh, I was toiling away at just what I thought was a mindless job. It was a lot of data entry. It was um, it was my time working at Carpet World, and I had been there since 9.30 in the morning, and it was 2 o'clock, and right there I realized after five hours on the job and a short lunch, I was burned out, and, uh, you know, I quit, Frank, and that was, that's part of the message we're going to give today is, you know, sometimes you've got to admit when you've got burnout, and I knew it within five hours, I was burned the hell out from that Carpet World job. Still the shortest stint I've ever had somewhere, but I want to give the people out there hope that you don't have to keep grinding the way I did and go through the chronic stress that I felt. Uh, and I can still remember the stress of looking at that clock thinking, holy shit, there's still an hour and a half left to this day. You don't have to deal with it, Frank. You can move on. It always comes down to Ian grinding. Grinding in the air conditioning, sitting behind a desk, not not an asphalt farm or anywhere else. So th this is what I think. Like, is, the time you can remember having burnout. Do you remember? Uh, was it at MVR? Was it? Where, what's the time you remember just being like, "I'm burned out," where you had all the symptoms of burnout? And here's the symptoms. Let me give you the symptoms first. Okay, so uh, 
from a quick half-ass internet uh, research, I found that the signs that you may be experiencing burnout are you're feeling like every day is a bad day. You are, you've got insomnia, you have trouble sleeping because you're thinking about the next day of work. And it, it's, it's not thinking about work because you and I, even today, we still wake up in the middle of the night thinking of something, but it's not, I don't know if you feel like that's, that's not burnout to me. That's just being busy and having things to do. Like a lot of times I wake up and I'm energized. I'll go, go get up. This is like waking up, dreading, dreading work the next day. You can't stand to go there. Every day feels the same. You're uninterested in the mission or what's the point of all this work. So you're, you're dis, your work is disconnected from any meaning whatsoever. Um, money's literally the only thing keeping you going to work the next day. Um, and you start to have some different physical symptoms like headaches, upset stomach, shortness of breath, uh, apathy, constant anxiety, trouble focusing, feeling out of control. So that's, those are some of the symptoms. The, the classic workplace burnout definition is a uh, syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that's not been successfully managed. It's characterized by three dimensions, feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from your job, or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job. So that's the definition, those are the signs. As I said those, can you think of a specific time in your career where you were absolutely burned out? You're on mute, big fella. It doesn't work well with a podcast to, to mute when you try to speak to me. Folks, we're just, we're, we're stretching out these muscles again. It's been a little while. Um, you can all see how I got burned out from podcasting with a fucking host like this. Uh, <laughs> And as bad as I am, I'm very hard to replace. Um, so, <laughs> you can't find anyone else that wants the job. Who would? I don't know what it is. I sit in my office all week. Nothing happens. I get on a podcast with you. People get on the roof. People start jumping up and down, turning on music. Someone's in, my, blowing, someone's, in my, someone's in the parking lot with a backup alarm. I'm getting burnout with all this burnout. <laughs> so... Ian desperately wanted me to tell a story about like the Outback, right? So I think there's a di there's a couple of different things that that I've experienced maybe burnout within my life. Um, when I was younger, I wasn't as talented mentally, so the jobs that I found weren't the grueling things that Ian did at Carpet World, but like working as a busboy, working in construction, or working a di as a dishwasher. And I remember being very, very, very tired from those events. And feeling like I needed a break from that. But it was physical work and I was in my 20s, but I can imagine doing that kind of physical work, 50s and 60s, like it probably was awful. But I do remember having empathy for how hard that work was. I also remember being a kid and thinking about like steel workers, right? Like something you can relate to, Ian. Yeah. I, there was a summer that you've told me the story where you work with all these steel workers and you were running around and you were like setting records and they're like, slow down. And you're like, why? I can do it this fast. You're like, well, you haven't been doing it for 30 years. So I feel like there's real burnout in those physical jobs that kind of yeah. come along with that. I'm sure that's something you you can you dealt with with kind of talking with your dad. Oh yeah, yeah. Where they, you know, I remember those workers looking at me and being like, Yeah, asshole, we could do it really good for three months too. You know, like you're setting a pace that's gonna force us to do it for 30 years. Don't do that. And like, we can't do that. What you're doing in and I think that's interesting. That's that's interesting parallel to what we're talking about here. Anyone can grind their ass off for three months at anything. And that was kind of the same with you. A lot of your jobs were summer jobs. You'd work for Christmas, then go back to college. So you could kind of grind the hard job, get some cash, take some girls on dates. Like you had a reason for it. But if it was a career, that wouldn't have been as exciting a work for you. It would have been, it would have been demotivating because you don't have something next to look forward to in it but i i certainly remember when you were getting burned out at mbr because it was for me it would have been when you were driving like it was almost was it weekly you would have to drive up like two and a half hours to get to fairfax for that like weekly meeting and you were like what is the point of all this yeah so th so there there's physical burnout which i think is probably not people listening to this podcast are suffering from because most people are you know in a you know white collar type of a job that are 
an interest in what we have to say. But when you get into a white collar job or you strive to, I think you have to look at like what's worth like work life balance, right? And you have to figure those things out. And so what I think is really interesting about this is I definitely had periods where I felt tired or I didn't want to do it or I lost sight of the mission. And, the, and as what Ian said is basically the only thing you're willing to chase is the money. But what I think is interesting about this, and this is where I think you and I might differ, I think that's kind of where we were raised. And the way that I was raised was tough shit. You're going to get tired. You're not going to feel good. You're not going to want to go do that. Well, do you want to put food on the table? Then go do it. And it's, I think where we are generationally is I feel as if people talk about burnout, like they want to avoid it. Well, you're probably going to also avoid success in a lot of ways. Now, if you can work at a company like Google that prioritizes perfect work-life balance and those types of things, fantastic, go do it. But I think for the majority of us, I'm not smart enough to work that way. And I knew that about myself pretty early. So I kind of embraced to suck. I didn't work in a restaurant for summers. I worked there for seven years because I thought I needed to, to get through college, even though my parents mostly paid for it. Like there was a lot. So like, I think there is a, the way that it was ingrained in me is this is part of life. And it's, there's a luxury to be able to talk about burnout. Your dad didn't have the luxury of talking about burnout. He showed up and he went to the fucking mill day after day after day. Yeah, well, and he didn't have as many choices. You know, once he got deep into that career, he, he wasn't going to go back to college and there weren't there weren't a lot of other places to go. So you get tenure, you get paid a little more, you're in a union. Um, so, yeah, you're right. He, he couldn't be like, oh, son, I'm feeling burnout. Like they didn't even have words like that, you know, for that. You, you were tired and, you know, you were kind of constantly grumpy because you weren't sleeping a lot. I don't know if it was the healthiest thing, but... Uh, I think, and this might be insensitive as we talk about this, but I think folks who are college educated, who are smart, who are capable, I think if you are feeling burnout for an extended period of time, it's sort of your own fault today. And the reason why I say that, there's just too many opportunities. There's too many different things you could be doing, too many companies offering the same exact job you're currently doing, largely in the same neck of the woods that you're doing it. So I don't I don't necessarily think that I don't think that you should ever feel trapped working in an economy as good as this uh, and as diverse as this with so many different opportunities. So there's there's this, this a, a famous Stanford speech that Steve Jobs used it was for the commencement for 2005, so nearly 20 years ago. And what he talks about in there is you've got to find something you love. Now Steve Jobs is going to be he's going to go down as one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the history of the world. Uh, he literally changed the 21st century with his iPhone. So not all of us are him. But what he talks about inside of this speech that I love is if you have the ability to change, you should. And if you're doing things that don't inspire you, you should change them. So what I want to kind of wallow on in a minute before we get to the other side of this is how you can make change. I think this is generational and it's in it. There's something that's happened. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact of where we are in the world and in the cycle. So there's a book that I've read and I talked to you a little bit about it and it's called um, The Fourth Turning. And what it talks about is basically every 80 years, the shit hits the fan. And he goes back thousands, like literally 4,000 years when they were kind of before the written word. But there's cycles. Think about how we were raised it was from people that were born in the Great Depression, that lived through World War One, World War II. Like they would love to be able to tell you about burnout. Like anybody who stood up in World War II that thought about burnout got shot in the face. So they didn't have the luxury of talking about burnout. We're going to get into coaches. Coaches can talk about burnout. Nick Saban's making 10 to $15 million a year. Just 20 years ago, the average NFL salary was $2 million. NFL head coach's salary. Today, the average NFL salary is just under $7 million. So what's lost in a lot of this is it's a luxury to get talk, to be able to talk about burnout. Like when you're, there's a, a draft sending you to war, tough shit. You're going to get burned out. You're going to have to sleep under it. Like we talk about funny stories of Bill when he was in Vietnam and like it's really good to drink coffee when it's like 115 degrees outside because it cools off the body. Like 
like the, it, I think that there is a luxury to being able to have a conversation about these types of things. Yeah. Yeah. You take someone who, you know, you take a soldier who's at war, that burnout lasts with you the rest of your life. Yes. Like that, right? like that, that leads to, that leads to serious mental disorders that, that challenges stress, constant stress, uh, burnout in the workplace. Again, there's too many options for you to wallow in it too much. That's my opinion. But I, I think there's, I, I think there's a lot of different things. There's, there's a, um, there's a doctor, it's a neurobiologist, um, Dan Siegel. He came up with this um, term called the window of tolerance. Um, which I find fascinating. It, which is, yeah, really interesting. Actually, a good friend of mine uh, has gone through a loss and he was telling me about this a little bit. Um, it, it's, we kind of got this optimal zone of arousal where it, some stress is good stress. And we were kind of, when we're in that window of tolerance, we're neither hyper aroused, we're not overstimulated, too stressed or too anxious or understimulated, withdrawn, bored, kind of out of it. And either one of those can burn you out. Burnt, you can be burned out by being way too bored. Like think of, think of my carpet world job. That was not a high stress job. It was incredibly boring, right? So yeah, I could imagine if I tried to do that job for an extended period of time, I'd have burned out fast, right? Luckily for me, I like drinking games and I had one to play the next day. So I had to quit that job or at least have Jeff do it but for no, me. But in all seriousness with it, like not just carpet world, but like, I didn't feel like I was utilizing my skills the right way at NBR. Like I, like it, it, what ended up being the ultimate demise of my career there had been burning for a couple of years because I was asking myself on the opposite side, is this really enough? And in 19, and when I quit in 2009, the internet wasn't the internet. There wasn't the workforce remote. There wasn't zoom. You couldn't work like from wherever you were in the world globally sitting on a chair using a webcam like that wasn't an option and i think those options have come around i think tech this is like the scary thing about ai right like what's going to change and who's going to be left behind but the point of all of this that's kind of coming is there is incredible freedom most of the things we do don't require our hands anymore what they require is our brains and our ability to use a keyboard and our ability to research or to think with your head and how do you do those things so there is i think a massive shift in this but I remember when I quit starting my business, I was desperate to be busy. Like I was desperate to have things to do. It was like, it was non-stimulating. And Ian, this is something that people deal with all the time when they retire. They go from being really, really, really important to not having all of those stimuli that are pushing them. And ultimately a lot of people die because shortly after retirement, because they've, they've lost that need, want, and desire to be significant, which really forces you to get into something. Well, I think we both, you and I both left NBR being understimulated. Uh, I, I know my last year at NBR was a record year on almost everything I was measured on. Like we're, our staff was great. Our profits were great. Everything was solid. I had an unbelievable team. Um, I, many of the people that work for me are still running that company. It was a solid, solid team. I was bored. I'd, I'd been doing it for 13 years and it was wholly uninteresting to me. And I, the anxiety that was persistent that I had was, is this all you've got? Is this, is this it? This is, you're going to look back on 40 years of your career and you're going to say you were a mortgage guy that whole time. Like Christ, Ian, is that what you are? It like, I, I would constantly be battling that anxiety and that's, I love mortgage folks. Some people love it. I never loved it. It was a means to an end for me. I liked being an executive. I liked building teams. I never really cared about the nuts and bolts of that business. So for me, I always felt like there was something better I should be doing or more impactful or more interesting. And so my stress, my chronic stress, and I had plenty of it for the last year there, was just the anxiety of, I can't believe I'm still doing this. Like, what am I doing as, as I went through it? And so that, that whole window of tolerance, you have to know your sweet spot and you have to be able to recognize, is this good stress or is this chronic stress that's silly? Right. Like there was there was no longer anything. Is, it worth, is it worth it? Is it is worth it? it for me to go through this bullshit 
And is the other side worth it? So like without giving too much away with your, your career, you moved from Chicago to Virginia and you moved for a job that was, it was, it was, it, you leapfrog. You were really smart. You did five different things at GE and five different disciplines. And you talked to people at NVR and you basically said, look, I know how to learn different business segments and I know how to grow business. And you were a fresh young voice and you convinced your wife and you didn't have kids at the time, but to move to a foreign city with no real friends. And it, like, there was an agreement that you and I've talked about over the years of we're going to just bury our heads in the sand and we're going to plow through for a period of time. Yep. But kind of like the coaches whose salaries have now skyrocketed, they don't have to coach because they don't need it. You didn't have to do it anymore because you didn't need it. And then there was a real opportunity to say, I don't need this, so I won't. And you and I, this is the Stanford speech with Steve Jobs. This is you and I both leaving NVR. It's conversations I ask myself inside of my business all the time. Do I want to continue to spend my time doing this? Is the misery that I have to put in worth it? So I think what we pivot to at this point in the inter at this point is kind of where you wanted to go with this of if you're in a spot where you're facing burnout, be proactive, take that, understand the window of tolerance is running out and put yourself in a spot where you can possibly leap. From. I think that's right. I, so the, the, the first thing I would say, and we have four main points we want to talk about how to deal with, I would say chronic stress or burnout. Uh, the first thing you've got to do is develop your challenge response. A challenge response, uh, psychology term, uh, challenge response is how do, you, how do you respond to a major stressor that's been put on you? So the, the majority of, of, of stress is controllable, but people tend to focus on the uncontrollable. And so the challenger response is whenever you're faced with a problem, ask yourself, what am I in control of? What's the very next step? Not, not what are the next 12 steps? I'm not big on 12 steps. I'm big on what can I do in the next 30 seconds that will take a little bit of my stress down if I'm successful, right? So that could be make another sales call, that, right? If, if I'm in sales and I'm not hitting my plan, do some prospecting, call and follow up with the prospect. It doesn't mean closing a sale. It means next step, pick the phone up, dial it, right? It could be anything revol revolving your stress, what role am I playing in creating this stress, this mess around myself and develop that, that growth mindset, that challenger response of I'm feeling stressed. My body's telling me something. What am I supposed to do with this a new adrenaline that I've been given, right? Because it's your body telling you, hey, dude, get to work. You got a problem. You should be stressed about it. I'm giving you a little adrenaline kick. Don't freaking waste it. Like, go get your mindset right and work on the very next thing you can do to get your stress down. There's two things I want to in, enter in here with this. So the challenge response thing you talk about, incredible, right? So the challenge response is going to come. And when the challenge response comes, what I think of are two things. Number one is this. When people have lost control of a car, what they typically do is they end up hitting a tree. And the reason they end up hitting a tree is because they look at the tree while they're in a spin out and they don't look at the open road field, something like that. They're steering the car and they're going to ultimately hit what they look at. So we naturally look at the tree and we hit the tree. But what you want to train yourself into is look away from the tree, go to the open field, go to the, go to the open road, go to the space where there's safety. The way that we talk about it in our company about this is look at zero to one. If you're getting stressed out and you look at the entire thing, Rome was not built in a day. It was built over literally two centuries, Rome. Um, so if you look at it from that perspective, it doesn't happen like this. It happens slowly. So what's zero to one? What's the one thing you can do to take control? Is it walk outside, take a deep breath? Is it go get a drink? People go on cigarette breaks because it literally changes your state. Like literally you start sucking in air. Now you're sucking in nicotine with it, but you're, you're changing your state and then you go back. So how do you do one thing, just go from here to there that gets you in the path of going forward? And what I like to look at is, okay, I'll put together 12 things, I'll arrange them, I'll put them in eight things, or five things, whatever the number is. And you say, okay, here's the thing, it's kind of the low hanging fruit. They teach you when you pay off debt that what you wanna do is you wanna get into momentum. The best thing you can do is you can pay off the most expensive debt. 
But sometimes they say pay off the smallest one first, even if the debt is less, the percentage is less, because it gives you a moment. Yeah. And then you get to go into the next thing. So that, and when you build your challenge response, understand the natural makeup of your body and then figure those things out. Steer the open area and do zero to one. I love that. Um, so the second thing I would say at, after the challenger response and getting your mindset right of what can I focus on is I find that when I get under a lot of pressure, what my natural response and from watching my parents, right, and my grandfather, is I work more. I work more hours, right? And that's very normal. I, high achievers, we don't like to lose. So it's like, screw it. Mamba mentality, let's grind. I'm going to get my ass in earlier. I keep, you know, keep working earlier, keep working later. I'll go back to the office at night. I'll work weekends. I'll do this. That's all fine. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer that work-life balance, I believe that balance is a function of ambition. If you have high ambition, you should not expect to work common hours. That's right. If you have uncommon goals, you're going to work uncommon hours. Like, don't tell me you have big goals of making a lot of money if you're not willing to work more than the average bear. But where before I screw get, up. Before you get into your butt, like I interview kids all the time and they tell me constantly, like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to do this job, mostly in sales. And I say, what it takes is it takes hours in the seat. Your ass needs to be in the seat. If you're not in the seat, you're not going to succeed. And when I leave here, I leave here, when I come to the office, I don't come every day. But when I leave, I usually leave between six and seven. I and mean, the place is a ghost town. Like literally the lights in our office are set to shut off at seven o'clock because nobody's here. Like that's not ass in the seat. You can call people until nine o'clock at night. And every now and again, I see somebody bleary eyed walking out of here at seven o'clock. As a 20 year old, you've got to put those hours in. You got to kind of understand, you got to push through it. Cause if you, it just requires time in a lot of instances. So you have to kind of put that on, on the shelf before you come into the, some of the strategies with when long, hour, letting long hours dictate bad habits. It's funny how the definition of whatever it takes has changed over time. When you, For when, sure. you and I, when you and I would say whatever it takes, it meant hundred hours if that was necessary in a week to get something done. It's a little different today. Whatever it takes means whatever it takes between 8.30 and five o'clock. That's whatever it takes. But for me, and 4.45. Here's where I screw up. Here's where like, I, I, I'm unapologetic, Frankie, about working a lot of hours. But I think where I screw up is when I start working a lot of long hours, I also let it take away from things that I need to do for my physical well-being. So I, you know, I'm getting into my office at 5.30 in the morning instead of getting into the gym at 5.30 in the morning. Because in my mind, I'm like, well, I have a lot of work to do and I'm already up at five. So that gives me two and a half hours on everyone else. I'm just going to do that today. But then that becomes like a trend where I'm starting to get into my office six in the morning and I'm not going to the gym or I get away from reading, which is really therapeutic for me. I'm a big reader. I love to read. But when I start working a lot of hours, I have to cut from other places, but you can't, you know, I, maybe I stop having dinner with my family, which is really important to me. Or, uh, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, missing some practices when I'm coaching or I'm not outside, you know, that's another big one for me. So like working out, reading dinner with my family, dates with my wife, uh, coaching, getting outside and getting sunlight. These are all like very important things for your body. And stress is so related to physiological stress that you go through. So you, uh, even if, even if I'm working hard, I have to be cognizant that like the things you need to give up right now are watching TV, uh, you know, screwing around on your phone. Like I have to cut, make sure that's what I cut out. And I'm not cutting out the things that keep my body in tune and keep my other stress levels down. So, what, so with this, I think one of my favorite things about the Dan Patrick show, I don't watch it a lot, but whenever I tune in, at least when I used to tune in, they had a basketball hoop. So they would always go on break. And when you go on break, it's for commercials or for whatever, right? And they would show Dan, walk over and get a basketball and just shoot a couple hoops, shoot like six hoops. And then he'd go to the bathroom, get a cup of coffee and sit back at his desk. But it's an incredible reminder that you need physical activity in your day to reset your brain. 
And when I think about the biggest things I've ever achieved in my life, they always had a physical component with them. So I was really proud of myself in ninth grade. I studied really hard for a hard exam. I remember this still. And I remember studying and I was, I started to feel back then it wasn't called burn. I'd started to feel tired and I got up and I ran outside and I shot some baskets and I ran around the neighborhood like three or four times. And then I got a cold glass of water and I lay back down and I studied. And then I did the same thing three or four times. I had to study for like eight hours. And I remember I got the grade. It was like one of those, you remember those like back in school where you would have to work really hard. And if you got the right grade, it would carry your whole, like the, the, if you got the right grade in that final, it carried your whole grade up. And it was like, yeah. I, it was like at a B and I, had, I wanted to get an A and I was like working my ass off. But I thought of that in after, the, this was ninth grade. I thought about it in high school. I thought about it in college. I literally used to sit, I, I would lay on the floor is how I like to study. And I would do that in college. I'd like find a place where I could lay on the floor and find that exact same position to do the work. So I learned how to do it, but it had a physical component. I got up, I would shoot hoops. I go for a run. I go for a walk because you can only do so many hours of blasting through where you have to kind of reset. The other thing that I learned in my life as I got older was, so I'm a big fan of this diet that came out years ago. It's called Body for Life. And one of the things he teaches you in there was what's called a planned over. So you've heard of a leftover, Ian, have you ever heard of a planned over? Mm. So a planned over, instead of just having extra food is you literally say, okay, I'm going to have a, you know, I'm going to make food for the family, but I'm going to make so much of it that I have three extra meals left. I'm planning to have more because I'm doing it all the right way. But that planned over can also be incorporated into your work life. So my wife, is insanely organized and she's a professor. So she builds a curriculum and an, a, um, what's it called? A syllabus for every semester. So every semester for her, it's four month chunks over the course of the year. It's different because she gets different classes and different stuff. So what she'll tell me is, hey, this semester on this particular night, I'm gonna work late. Does that work with you? And what we do as a family unit is the night she works late is not the night I work late. So she's got a night where she's away from the family because she's going to put in a long, a long session. Now, I usually do that once a week, too. I either do it on a weekend morning or I'll do it on a, on a night. And I try not to have it kind of come against hers. So that way, what we're doing is we're planning for the stress. We're planning for the burnout, but we're doing it in one silo, which gets us back into the family, gets us back into rhythm as a, fam as a group. And it moves. So these are ways that you can plan for these things like a planned over and do it in in succession and then you can do it with multiple people working kids all the stuff so number three um and this is a big one especially for guys i find um drop your ego and talk about the chronic stress that you're feeling so um I, i've always used the analogy when i talk to salespeople about how to get a customer to calm down a little bit. And it's usually by asking a lot of open-ended questions. And the, the analogy I like to use is, you know, pipes, if you look at pipe and plumbing, they have pressure valves and they have pressure valves for a reason. If the pressure gets too high, a pipe breaks. And human beings are sort of the same way. We let this pressure build up inside of us and we don't talk about it. And it just keeps building and building until like, if you ever see someone lose it on a customer in an office or lose it on a teammate and just yell or a manager just lose it, flips their lid one day and the face gets all red and they're yelling. And you're like, what a maniac. How could they do that in the office? And it's, that's just months of stress of, of passive aggressive activity because they haven't talked to someone or worked it through. And then one day just a straw breaks the camel's back and they, it's that tipping point that hits that they go through. I just had this I just had a moment like this, not, not the yelling piece of it, but um, we were down in Florida over spring break and I had a lot going on. I, I had a, a keynote coming up. I was in the middle of like six group programs with six to eight people in it each. I had helping another me raise money for a deal. Yeah. So I had another five or six executive programs. I was helping Frankie. We were trying to raise two and a half million dollars in like two weeks. And Frank's like, can you get it by Wednesday? And I'm like, holy shit, I got all these calls to make and people are calling me back. David and I are putting a pitch deck together for venture capital for keep. We're looking to raise 10 to 20 million. Frankie, I just had like everything 
hitting all at once. It was a really crazy moment for me. And I, Jenny and I kind of got into a little, we were bickering a little bit the night before at dinner and it had nothing to do with her or anything else. My mind was completely distracted. And so people kept talking to me at dinner and they would have to say the same thing like three times. And it was irritating Jenny because I'm with her parents and my kids. And so like the next day we went for a long walk on the beach and I just unloaded everything, like pretty much what I just told you. But, and, and I got into like, I'm feeling a lot of pressure. I'm feeling a lot of stress. Like I haven't had this much going on in a long time and I love it. And I wouldn't choose to do anything other, but all I really needed to do was talk for like an hour and a half. She just listened to me. Okay. And listen, what can we do? To do and went through it. And it was so therapeutic. She could understand what I was going through. But for me, I talked through my next five steps I needed to take when I got to the office on that Monday. And I hadn't been sharing with her because of ego. Like I didn't want to burden her with it. I'm the, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the producer of this family. I need to be making money. Uh, I need to figure all this out. I wasn't talking to her, but it wasn't healthy for me or her. And it was a really good conversation, but I, I find Frankie, I do this for a living. I coach for a living. I talk to executives and it usually takes me three or four conversations before they start telling the truth. And I almost need to nudge them most of the time, right? Where they're dancing around something. I'm like, Hey, listen, you, you hired me for a reason. You're not, I'm not cheap. Do you want to really tell me what's going on? Cause I feel like we're kind of on the surface of some stuff. Like, like, let's get down to what are you stressed about? What is, what are you insecure about? What is freaking you out? What are you really worried about? What's like, let's get under the hood a little bit more. And if I can get people to talk, I find that most of the time they have all the answers. They know what they should be doing, what they're not doing. They know why they're avoiding it. I, I have one hour conversations sometimes, Frankie, where I talk for like five, 10 minutes and I just listen while they do most of the coaching of themselves. They're executives. They, they know what the hell to do. They just, are, are not good at vocalizing what freaks them out and what's stressing. And, you know, I think it's probably a reason why you have an executive coach that you work with. So I think yeah. in, a, in a lot of instances, the problem that you deal with with this is it's embarrassing and you think you're weak or you're, you're a problem, right? So Ian and I have several deals that we are commingled on. Um, he's helped me raise money for different things. I've got millions, of, I've got Ian's money in the deals. Um, I've got millions and millions of, I've got his mom's money in deals. Like I have millions of dollars from Ian's friends and family in my deals. Ian's got hundreds of thousands of dollars of my money in his deals. So we both feel the stress of not wanting to let our friend down, never wanting to make a tough phone call, not wanting, Ian doesn't want to tell my dad he's lost his money. I don't want to tell Ian's mom I've lost her money. And we were both drunk in Omaha about a year ago. And like, it finally came out, like we're both stressed out that we're going to lose the other person's money. And it was like three bottles of wine and three years after it started. And we both had the same pressures. So what's really critical here about dropping your ego is you can't tell your four-year-old this. You can't do this with a lot of your friends because they don't have the ability to process it and go through it. So having a peer group matters. Having people that you can talk to who are going through something similar matters. Now, if you have the ability or you work for a company and the company has the ability to hire someone, fantastic. But if you put yourself amongst like-minded people, it's one of the reasons I've been such a huge proponent of mastermind groups and such a, and I've re-engaged in mastermind groups and people call me constantly about, will you start your own? Because they want to be around people that are dealing with similar things to them. So it doesn't sound embarrassing. You're talking to somebody who understands. Now, Ian has been married for 20 years. He's married to an incredible woman. They have a very strong marriage, but not everybody has that. And Jenny, his wife, has got a smart business brain. So you can have those conversations with her. But like if I'm frustrated about something that has to do with sports, I can't talk to my wife about it because she doesn't get it. But she does understand the business stuff. So you have to have outlets that you can talk to different people about. And it's critical. And dropping the ego and getting there is also really important with who you are you talking to. So the last one, the last point we'll get to here is uh, take a break. The, the, this was really big. So Frank and I are a good example. We've made it clear. We were gone for nine months, right? Our loyal listeners were really sad about it. But Frank and I needed a break from podcasting. We had a lot of other things going on, as I just noted, uh, and, and Frank did. 
So we needed a break, right? We had a little bit of, I don't know if it was totally burnout. We just didn't have enough room on our schedule to keep it going. It and no longer excited us. Like we did, we don't get paid to do this. This costs us money. And in, so, like do, in so doing, it wasn't fun. And now we, Ian and I still talked. We still did things. We didn't want to do this. And we stopped because we could. Yeah. And then we missed it. And so the break was like, okay, it doesn't feel like stress anymore. To Let's go record again. It'll be fun a little bit. Um, Michael Jordan, classic example, all the pressure in the world on that dude. He won three championships. The pressure was he had to win every single year. It was a grind. It was every day. He went play baseball for a few years. He came back. He was an even better basketball player because he missed it and he was excited. I've seen so many people, Frank, who leave a company and come back better. Like they leave and, and you're a dumbass company. If, if you have some policy of like, if you leave, you're not coming back. Now, like if you love someone, let them go and see if they're happier somewhere else. And if they come back, they're going to be more energized. Right. And it's, I, I could tell you five on four groups. So Frankie, I do <laughs> spring is really stressful for me because I start programs right after the end of the year. So we go January through kind of April, I'm wrapping up a lot of my programs. And then I start them again. I do September, October, November, but in the middle there, May, June, July, I have no groups. I don't do groups. Even if people ask me to, I say no, because I need a break because it's a demanding. My business is sort of I'm, I'm on all the time. I'm, I'm the product. I take three months off where I don't do groups. Uh, I do other things. I work on other businesses, but I go re-energize. I go get myself. I go on vacations. I, I'm out in the sun a lot. I take long walks. I go hang out with my kids a lot because they're off of school. It's when I rejuice myself. And then in the fall, I'm ready for the next group of 30, 40 managers to go through my programs so I can give them more of myself. If I just tried to go and I could, it, summer programs, fall, and never take a break, I don't think I would be the same trainer. I don't think I would be the same person that's talking to them. I wouldn't be as excited and enthusiastic to go through with every new group. You've got to find ways to take breaks. So I, I think this is relevant to say, and it's a couple of things, right? Like, what is one of your all-time favorite things to do right now? It's Coach IJ's Muck Dog Team. Am I right? Totally, totally. And you've told me that yourself. Like, spring, you get all excited. Like, the first tournament that I know about is your friend. It's around St. Patty's Day. And yeah. I think you guys go through, like, October. So it's, not, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a ten, it's an eight-month season. But eight yeah. months of people in tight quarters, you, gotta need, you need a break. Look at all sport teams, all sports leagues. They basically are eight months and there's four months off. The players go and restore their bodies. The managers get away and then they come back. Yeah. They think and they use their brains. They use a different part of it. For me, I can't just check out. I'm the only person in my company who can sign a check. I'm the only person who can make certain decisions. So I can't just stop. Now, that's part of my decision making. I, I, I can't go cold turkey. Now, I can go yeah. cold turkey for a couple of days, but I can't go cold turkey for a week or an extended period of time. So what I do when I take a break is I put it in a box. I'll be on email from 9 to 10.30, blah, 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 and I do it. When we went on our honeymoon, my wife and I went for 17 days, and we had a, a window every day where we worked. She got into stuff and read and used her computer. I was on the phone. And then when that was over, it was time to move on. Now, it felt like a fantastic trip, but we couldn't completely disconnect because it's unrealistic. So you have to be able to pick those things that make a lot of sense for you. The reason that we need to end this podcast a minute ago is because of this. Sometimes take a break needs to be, I know when to celebrate. And we had a huge accomplishment that we were trying to, to achieve for years in this business. And it kind of felt like a wet fart. It just ended. Like it was just over. There was no celebration, no anything. So I'm dragging Carla out of here in four minutes. We'll get in my car. And we're going to a really nice lunch at a really nice place. And then we're going to go, she's going to get facial and I'm going to get a massage and we're going to chill out for the better part of a day. And now is it a whole cool. day? Is it a week? Is it a month? It isn't. But sometimes you've got to put a break into your schedule and you have to realize this took a lot out of me and it's time now to reward myself for the people around me for achieving it. And you, it, you have to celebrate it. So the way that I started this, I do think this is societal and I think it's a luxury to be in a position where you can get burned out. But as an employer, as a father, as a husband, as you know, just trying to be a, a good member of society, you have to look at both sides. This is real. 
people are dealing with it and there's a life outside of work and you have to find that balance between those things. And if people in your company aren't good at finding the balance, you have to help them find it. Because what will happen is this, if you don't help them find it while they're employed with you, they will quit. They will leave, they'll go somewhere else that gives them the ability to do those things. So it, it, it's it, 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 this is real and you have to pay attention to it because it'll bite you in the ass if you don't. I love that. I, the only thing I'll add on that, you know, when I was talking about the long walk, I went out with Jenny in Florida. She was down there for like nine days. The kids had spring break. She went down with her parents. I was down there for two. That was it. Like if you want to start a business, there's some realities, right? This comes back to the balance as a function of ambition. I really enjoyed myself on the two days. I was there for two of the nine, right? I wasn't there for all of it. That's a, that's my spring season though. That's my Super Bowl. I just told you about in the summer. If I go, I'll relax a little more. I think that the advice I would give people is most people aren't listening to this aren't business owners, your employees. Stop taking half-ass vacations. Turn off your phone. Quit taking all of your vacations or long weekends. Let, you know, you get three weeks of a 15 days of vacation. Yeah. Some people like to just make them all Fridays and you're not really disconnecting. You're still working. Get off your email. You're not that important. You're just not. You're an employee. Like your company will survive if you're gone for a friggin' week if you go disconnect. That, that is healthier for you and more productive for your company. If you take an actual vacation, you'll come back juiced. You'll come back energized. Even if it's a week, don't take half-ass vacations. But, but you have to realize, am I just stressed? And is my body just telling me I need to go work on a problem? Or is this chronic stress that I can't solve? For me and Frank, when we left MBR, I couldn't solve the fact that I was bored. That's not solvable. It's not solvable thinking I'm not utilizing my potential. I'm not reaching. I, I couldn't solve it. Like the things I'd solved all the business problems. There wasn't anything I was stressed about. That was like, something's not working in my business. It was, I don't really enjoy this line of work anymore. And I've kind of tapped out of my potential. So that's when I had to go make a change. Most people, they, when they, when they get burned out, they just haven't realized I just need to go focus on a problem that I haven't fixed at work. And what's the next step I can take? And so there's a difference between chronic and regular stress. And that burnout doesn't have to happen if you take the right breaks, if you look out for your body, if you talk with someone that you trust, a coach who, like Frank said, understands what you're going through, who's a peer, someone who's been in your shoes. That's important with coaches who knows you probably around your income level. Um, and you develop your challenge response. If you can do all those things, I don't think burnout needs to be an inevitability. I think it's something you can manage if you're smart. Don't be a victim and just say, I'm getting burned out by my company. You're probably doing a lot of it yourself. And as an employer, you have to pay attention to employees that aren't good at managing it. If you don't yeah. do that, you're going to have a staff that can't, that's going to turn over a lot. So you've got yeah. to look at that. And the, peop the people here that are the most stressed out are the ones who need to break the most. And they're the ones who are in biggest jeopardy of me showing up one day and saying, you no longer work here because they don't have the ability to be balanced. If you're yeah. at a high stress level, if you're a pipe under pressure, you burst. And if you're a pipe under pressure, who's an employee, you pop, you make mistakes, you're, everything's too heightened. So this is balanced from the standpoint of the employee and the employer. Yeah, I come back to, I do think it's a luxury that we're all lucky to have, but it's also a spot that we've, we've worked to get to. I love that you finished with that, Frankie. So l look what Frank's doing. He's taking his, uh, you know, his highest ranking employee and making her leave the office and go focus on herself a little bit. He's also good at that about making sure that his employees take vacations, like all the things that we just mentioned, those four as a manager, you know, Make sure your people take vacations, real vacations. When they're on vacation, don't send them emails. Don't expect them to send emails back. Don't call them. Let them have a break. If they suck, and, if they suck at getting away from the office, help them not suck. Three days yes. before they leave, what are you working on? What are you doing? What are you stressed out about? What do you think you're going to have to touch when you're away? And if you can't take 90% of that off of their plate, you suck as a manager. 
Yes. yes. There yes. might be a couple of things that they need to do. Like, okay, you're allowed to check these three things. You're going to text me on Tuesday and Thursday. But besides that, I'm not fucking emailing you. And what I do is I put all of it in my outbox and I wait till they get back and I send it. Or I put a draft together and I just keep adding to the draft. And here are the 12 things that happened while you were away. And here it is. Because that, that sucks too to come back to 300 emails. You're just, you're not rewarding them for taking time away. So you have to be yeah. proactive. Know that their ego will get in the way and they won't talk to you unless you really probe and ask questions. Be a good coach. Really understand what their stress is. Ask questions about stress because as we said earlier, the ego keeps you from talking about it because you feel like that's a weakness. Make sure that they have good habits. If you see them in the office too much and they're not exercising, they've quit the healthy habits, that's not good for you. And develop their challenge or response to As a manager, develop it. Ask them, what's the next step you can take? What can I do to help? You can do the same things as a manager. And I'm going to let Frank go get his facial. He was lying. He's not getting massage. He's getting a pedicure and a manicure and a facial. And Carla will probably get the massage because Frank is a bit of a dandy. My pedicure is Thursday. Um, <laughs> but he is, for the past 47 minutes, I've been burned out with this podcast. <laughs> We are we have we have reached our chronic stress levels, Frank. We're gonna to have to go ahead and end this. See you, brother. To, have a good time with that pedicure and facial. See you, buddy. If you like what you just heard, and judging by the viewership numbers, you did, hit that follow button and leave us a five star review. It helps other people find the show. And it lets Frankie and I know that, you know, a few people are listening to this.